Welcome to the Wicked Ones. This is Jen. And this is Tara. And we are here enjoying our last moments of our little getaway at the Quality Time Cottage. Yeah, it's nice. We're just going to sit in here with our coffee. And we got the recording studio set up in the sunroom. and So we're going to, nice. we thought we, yeah, we thought we would squeak one little recording in before we head back to the madness and the chaos yes <laughs> where it's still quiet and we have a little extra time and i hope you enjoy it and if you hear any other extra noises that you're not used to yeah just give us some grace we're out here and it's a different it's a different setup i'm not really sure how it's gonna stand with all the windows hopefully it's fine you know? i think it'll be okay it might be a little different but i don't think it'll be right well all right let's just jump right in and get going on the story so again this week we're doing our I'm kicking off sports sports week yes. or sports month I guess I should say so what I I, I just kind of dug around a little bit and wanted to do something a little bit different uh I know that I have a feeling you're gonna do a football player soon and my other and I have another story that's a football player so I wanted to kind of go into something a little different entirely and I found a case uh, with two professional bodybuilders, actually, for my for my story today. You, does it sound familiar at all? No, not at all. No. That's kind of cool. It's, I'm not that bodybuilding is out of the norm, but I feel like it's not. It's not something in that the, in the spotlight as much. I don't hear about yeah, it as often. So. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I've known a few of them in college, and you know, because they had like the Mister SIU competitions and mm-hmm. stuff like that, and that was kind of interesting. It's just they have to they have to go through a lot to. For what they I do. worked with um, a bodybuilder, and her life was not fun. It doesn't seem like <laughs> no. It's right? not. I mean, that sounds really bad. But when she would come out to eat and stuff, she wouldn't eat, and she would have a cooler like in her car of what she could eat for the day because you can't like she. Her, you have to be regimented. Her diet was so regimented, and her workout schedule and everything was so regimented, and she did really well with it. But I just couldn't imagine. Mm-hmm. that lifestyle it just it takes some severe dedication it really does to get to get to that right yeah I, no, I don't right. know I so agree. I just thought it was interesting it was very strict and yeah. I'm already a strict person and if I think it's strict it's mm-hmm. a little yeah it's it's definitely something that you're all in <laughs> there's not just like a eh, kind of body build like you either do it or you don't right exactly so and I kind of like it when we start off you know right away with a little bit of kind of what happened why the police are there, why there's, a, why there's a case in the first place, what's going on, and then sort of circle back into who we're talking about, a little bit about their background, and then we'll kind of go back and talk about the details of the case and then the conclusion and what happened. So that's kind of, that's kind of how I arranged everything for you. So just so you're aware, we're going to be jumping around a little bit. Cool. Okay, so it all started with a 911 call in the early morning hours of December 14th in 2005. Okay, so... Head back in your, take yourself back to 2005. I, I have to it. remind myself to do that. I can see it. Although it's not like it was like the 80s or the 60s where I have to really go back and go, all right, we didn't have, you know, Google and all yes, of those yes. things like that. But still, 2005, there's a car fire out in the desert and it's um, it's on a road called Sandy Valley Road and it's near Las Vegas. So Fire Chief Draper takes the call from nearby Mountain Springs Fire Department. He rolls up and he's like, all right. I've seen this before a thousand times. Somebody didn't want to make the payments or maybe it's a stolen vehicle. The usual, right? Mm -hmm. And that to me is weird. Like There's like parts of the country that have just different things like this. Like apparently out there, they see car fires all the time. And this is usually the typical reason. You know, I mean, is that, doesn't that seem kind of strange to you? I mean, I've heard of it before. People abandon cars that they can't pay for all the yeah. time just probably depending on where you live it's done in a different way I would suppose yeah, in right? the desert you can burn it but you can't do that in like out here in places. Chicago where it's, uh, it's like the lake so everybody just drives, drives their it car in the lake. lake yeah I, I mean it's I guess it's kind of weird because if you burn it you still I mean it's still in your name I don't know yeah like, I, right. I don't I've know. heard of it I don't know but that process I'm not either. sure how that ends the someone problem. stole my car and burned, burned it, in it the desert. yeah like, I don't I don't know but I guess that's a common thing out there. So I don't know if people know any more about that occurrence and why that's so popular and what's going on. Tell us about it. Yeah. Yeah. So he mentioned that he thought he could handle the fire himself, but it was, I mean, it was pretty, this place was 
intense. I think I read that it was over 1200 degrees at one point in an article that, and I don't, not that I know my fires. I'm just telling you, like, oh, that's, you know, I don't know what that means, but it sounds very hot. But I mean, they could tell there was a lot of accelerant being used and there was, you know, it was, it was just a tough one to put out. So he's working on it and he said it took him over an hour. And as the flames were dying down, he noticed uh, an area in the back that was still, they're still smoking heavily. He's thinking, okay, that's a little odd. What's going on over there? So he brings his flashlight out and he's, he's shining it into the vehicle and he's trying to get a better look. And then he sees like this burnt, what, what appears to be a burnt arm. Of course, at this point, he's like, oh, holy shit, I, I'm done. I'm going to stop now. I'm going to call the police. They're going to come in. It's probably a homicide. Once law enforcement and the fire investigators arrive, there's not much left of the car but the metal shell. They open it up because the trunk's locked. They, you know, jimmy it open and they find a body inside. They can't, I mean, it's so burnt up that they can't identify it. So at this point, they just call her the Sandy Valley Doe due to the, the road and where she was found. This is what she's dubbed until they can figure out who this is. So they send it off to the medical examiner to learn, you know, the identification and hopefully cause of death. Inside the car, they can make out a few things from the wreckage. So pieces of a suitcase, some clothing, keys, tweezers, a barbecue set, syringes, and a purse. Got it. And then whoever set the car on fire, they didn't do anything about the license plate. So they're immediately able to tell that it's registered to renowned bodybuilder Kelly Ryan. And at first they're thinking, oh, God, she's probably the body in the trunk. Yeah, like she got kidnapped or yeah. whatever, and they put her body in. Right. Right. And and this is, so they show up at her house where she lives with her husband, Craig Titus, another very well-known professional bodybuilder. And they knock on the door, and they're shocked because Kelly an- answers the door. Like, nothing's wrong. Hey, what's going on? And they're like, oh, can you speak with Kelly Ryan? She's like, well, I'm Kelly Ryan. So here they're going, okay, well, if you're not the one in the car, we have, you know, we have even more questions than we had before. I'm sure they thought they were going to come and arrest the husband and be like, all right, here we go. Yeah, Case closed. it went a different direction, for sure. They tell the police the night before they had another couple over. They were celebrating. One of their friends had graduated college, so they were having a celebration. And around 2 a.m., they walked them out, and then they went to bed. And the next day, they woke up on the 14th, and they find the cars missing. She had never reported it. She had never reported it missing, or maybe they're just saying they didn't have time to report it. I, I don't know exactly what time they knocked on the door. I'm sure it was still pretty early morning. She said... Oh, I'm thinking that our assistant, Melissa James, probably came back and stole it. She's been stealing from us. It's been a whole situation. We kicked her out of the house. Craig bought her a plane ticket to head back to spend Christmas with her mom and just, she's done. She's out of here. But she tells police officers that she's a drug addict and she thinks she was stealing because she wanted to get money for drugs and she's the one who took the car. So this is the first that police even hear the name Melissa James. So now they're trying to figure out who is this girl? Is she the body in the trunk? Mm -hmm. What's going on? The story doesn't make sense. Right? It doesn't. So the same day, Melissa's mom, she's driving over to the airport to pick her up and she never arrives. She doesn't hear from her. She's trying her cell. Her best friend Samantha's trying to call her. They're frantic. They're trying to call Craig and Kelly, but they're not even answering their phone, which again, that's odd. And guilty. And guilty. Um, and so then she's she's getting frantic. She's doing what any mom would do. She starts calling hospitals. She's trying to figure out where her daughter is, what's going on. And it wouldn't be until later on that evening that she would get the call from detectives that they believe this burnt body found in the car in the desert was possibly her daughter. Which that's that's hard too. I actually had to look at that a few times because I thought they couldn't say anything until they had a positive ID, but at the same time, they need to investigate and figure out what's going on. Like, maybe they call and they're like, oh, she's home. Okay, well, then now yeah. we have to go in a new direction. But I just, can you imagine getting that call as a mom that your daughter may or may not have been the one in this car, in this fire, in the desert, and you're you're not sure, and you have to sit with that until there's an identification made? Yeah, and I wonder, too. I, I think it just, it's... I mean, there's a lot of different circumstances, right? Mm-hmm. So if she was a, I don't know if she was into drugs that much to where she would like ghost out for a couple of days and mm-hmm. no one could find her if that's like a normal behavior or if this is completely abnormal, that has to be her in the trunk. 
Do you know what I mean? I think it just. Oh, kinda, absolutely. I mean, I think they have to involve I think the family. I just, as a mom, can't on, imagine that. It would be a horrible, horrible situation and reaction I'm feeling, but I, I think that you, depending on your history with your daughter, you would have an idea. Mm-hmm. Well, and you're gonna want to do anything that you can to help with the investigation if it means bringing anybody to justice. So, I mean, I get all of that. It's just that would be so tough. I don't know. I just Terrific. was trying to put myself in that position, and I just I can't don't even want imagine. To. No. no. Police are still working with the medical examiner to find the cause of death, but Detective O'Kelly, one of the uh, investigating officers, says, and I quote, there's a bathrobe tie around her neck. There's also speaker wire, double-stranded speaker wire that was wrapped around her neck as well. At autopsy, there was evidence of strangulation involved. Even with the extensive burning, the medical examiner was able to say that. We also have, from above her eyebrows to below her lower lip, her entire head was encircled with duct tape. End quote. I know that was a really long quote, but I wanted to make sure that I told you exactly as they were saying what what was given to them from the from the autopsy at this point. I that's just horrific for one. But how if she's if the, everything was burnt up? How do they know about a bathrobe? I know. I I asked myself the same thing. I'm wondering if it was just like fibers that were embedded and they were able to tell it was from something like that. Like, oh, this is the polyester in this specific bathrobe. Yeah. Um, you know what I'm saying? I yeah. don't know. And I'm sure the speaker wires were maybe still there. Um, but then at the same time, this car is at what, 1200 or 1200. Yeah, did I say 1,200? 1,200 so. degrees yeah. or something like that, which sounds... I'm sure that's really Well, they hot. say there's nothing <laughs> yeah. left but the metal shell of the, the car, but the somehow car. these other things survived. So I don't know. Right. Interesting. Right. But I'm not... I'm Maybe the... Tr- not the- a metal, medical examiner, yeah. so I don't know what... <laughs> I know. Well, I mean, everything in... I mean, you're right. It was reduced to a metal shell, but maybe somehow the tr- being in the trunk... Some with all the smoke pr- protected the body a little. I don't know how all that works, but they, I mean, they were able to get some things from it, obviously. Mm-hmm. Got a little bit more for you, too. But even the fact that the chief was able to say, oh, that's a that's a burn up arm with in a shirt. So like part of the shirt survived. Yeah, that's that's what I had read that. Like he he looked in there. And not only was it whoever set the fire, arm, maybe like didn't a, douse the douse, trunk, yeah. like didn't. They mm. just figured if they that would do it, that would take care of everything. Yeah. I'm sure. The autopsy also showed that Melissa had toxic levels of morphine in her system that had been injected through her leg. So, again, enough survived that they were they able to that. make that determination. And that's weird. Yeah. Detectives also were able to search Melissa's room uh, when they had talked to Craig and Kelly uh, initially. And one thing that they noticed that was odd was that Kelly's credit card was found just right there in the open. You know, like, oh, huh, see, I told you she was stealing from us. Look, yeah. there's my credit card. You know, just really, <sighs> we're on to you. It's dumb. Yeah. Craig and Kelly, of course, did not stick around to talk anymore about it. After the police initially no. talked to them, they were like, we're out. They got plane tickets for real this time. Well, they sh- they certainly have plans to, let's put it that way. Okay, so let's pause and do a quick backstory on these two, their accomplice and the victim, Melissa James, before I tell you what happened next. About the, We'll talk more about the possibilities of what actually took place that night, because unfortunately, with all of what I'm going to tell you, it's not clear. There's we'll a never con- know. We'll never really know. There's a conclusion of sorts, but it's kind of, it's kind of up to what you, what you want to believe. Craig Titus was born in Wyandotte, Michigan. In the mid '60s, I say mid '60s because I hate when this happens. But our sources aren't clear, and some said 1965, 67. I don't know that it really matters, but some people care about that. They're like, "Oh, you know, where mm-hmm. was he born? Oh, I'm from Michigan. I wonder if I went to school with him." So mid '60s, <laughs> and he lived most of his earlier life in Riverview, which is I take it it's near Detroit. Um, there's several things in his childhood that came up, but really nothing terribly significant as far as family life goes. He came from a pretty normal, hardworking family. I mean, there was really nothing there that stood out to me that, to yeah, mention. average. Yeah, yeah. He played football when he was younger, but he ended up giving up the sport because he was just, he couldn't hang. He was too small. He was 5'6", 140, and 
apparently he couldn't he couldn't hang on the football field and or he just maybe didn't feel like I don't I feel like at that age and there's so many people that play football and so many people that make the team like if you want to be a part of the team you're a part of the team you know whether you play a lot or not I was gonna say yeah you you might yeah I mean but when I was in high school there was a you know we had a big football team but the little guys never really played. They were on the team and they yeah, practiced, but, you but know they what didn't I mean. get much playing time. So I don't maybe know. he was. I would just... never want to be on a team where I'm not playing. But knowing that my body people... stature, maybe yeah. I mean, like, look at us, Stella, Julia. You're not going to play basketball. <laughs> Your parents are short. Yeah. Like, what? you could maybe play now, but you're not. It's right. not. You're probably it, not going to play in college or high, even high if school. You have I mean, even but... now, you're short. It's odds are against you. So you might play it for fun, but if it's not, it's not bringing you joy because you're not good. Because you just, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? But I get. I do because I just think back. It's like you when you said you did gymnastics. Super small, in and high you school. were when you were younger, right? And then all of a sudden yeah. you realized you're tall. Gymnasts aren't tall. You you could not be a gymnast. Sarah. Point taken. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yes. Well, actually, I never really thought about that, but yeah, I couldn't. They're like, well, we can't do the uneven bars because for real, my feet probably would have drug on the ground. I mean, it was just really awkward. Yeah. So I think I think <laughs> it was just like, happen. once again, you have the tall person yeah. problem. I have the short person oh, problem. So yeah. Craig and I, okay, we so... have that problem. <laughs> All right. I'll give I'll give him the benefit of another doubt on that one. Then I guess he just, you know, I guess you're right. It probably just wasn't his thing. He was like, I can't do this. So, but you know what I'm saying? Like, if you want to be a part of the team, I'm sure you can be a part of the team. But Absolutely. for whatever reason, he's, he quit, the, he quit in ninth grade and he started working out and he kind of found bodybuilding. Well, a little bit later, I think, because it wasn't really in high school that he started doing like the bodybuilding. He just started you know, he just started putting on muscle. He was lifting weights. It made him feel better. Um, and then he also put on, a, or he also grew a few inches. You know, sometimes guys, they don't grow until their junior, senior year. Like mm-hmm. all of a sudden this one kid is like the shrimp. And then you turn around and you're at graduation and he's the tallest kid in the whole class. Right. By the time he was 21, he weighed in at 185 and he stood, uh, he stood at 5'8". So it's still short. It's still short. A couple inches taller. Um, so he started entering bodybuilding competitions in 1988, and he ended up being pretty successful right away. He won his very first competition that he entered. He won the men's open middleweight class and overall title in the Houston Bodybuilding Championships. He was doing really well. I mean, he was entering all these different things. He even competed for Mr. Olympia at one point, which doesn't say, I don't know what he placed, but the fact that he was able to even enter the competition is mm-hmm. It's pretty prestigious, and he even was hired at one time by Motley Crue's lead singer Vince Neil to whip him into shape. He had some VH1 appearance or something that he was going to be on, and he needed him. He's like, hey, you need to help me. And he even talks about how he was really into steroids and other things like that because he was he was actually having Vince take them when he was, you know, getting him into shape. And then just, just – that's such a crazy time, right? When it's it oh. just like everybody was using steroids and it was very rampant and nobody... It wasn't regulated. Yeah. I know. It, that was in, obviously, in your last story too. So it's just crazy to me. Many in the industry, however, were left with a really bad taste in their mouth after this guy takes second in a competition in 1995. And you know what he did? He took the trophy on stage, broke it into pieces, threw it down, and walked off the stage. A little, like, Roy Tantrum. Probably. He pouted. Mm-hmm. He was like, oh, I didn't win, so. Meh. I, you know what I mean. Yeah, like, I just, I can't stand people like that. No. You can be sad and disappointed, but. Take your participation trophy and. Yeah. Just <laughs> stop it. Yeah. Well, in the bodybuilding community, you respected the judges and the competition. This wasn't something that was ever. Not that it's okay in any sport because you, right? Like, I don't mean it to sound like, oh, only in bodybuilding are you supposed to be respectful. But it was just, it was very taboo, I guess I should say. Yeah. Like people were, they were just shocked. They were like, what the hell is wrong with this guy? But he was one of those hothead roid rage types, just like you mentioned. He's Mr. Tough Guy. And he started getting a reputation as the bad boy of bodybuilding. Between that and being picked up later on for drug charges for dealing X, like this guy was just known as 
you know, he's still allowed apparently in the bodybuilding arena, but he's known as the bad boy. Yeah, he, he's problematic. Very much so. And he loved his new title. He loved that people said this about him. He thrived on it. Of course, we all know those people. So I mentioned he got picked up for, for dealing um, X. He actually didn't go to jail at that time for that. He received probation. But, of course, when you are on probation, you can't you can't have any drugs in your possession. And because of his steroid use, they nailed him on that. And he spent 21 months in prison. So it was really for the... That's a long time for... It is. Yeah, that's a long time. It is. I'd be curious. To People get less for much... Yeah. I don't want to say much worse, but... Right. I know. I'd be curious to see how much he got picked up for. Yeah. As far as the drugs and the ecstasy. When he got out of prison in the late 90s, he went back into bodybuilding. And this is when he started pursuing Kelly Ryan. Kelly was born in 1972 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. But her family ended up settling in one of our very favorite places in the entire U.S. Where do you think? South Carolina. South Carolina. Greenville, to be exact, where we absolutely love going. Shout out to my aunt who lives there. Love it there. Greenville's downtown. People, if you've never visited Greenville or gone to Greenville, I highly recommend it. Isn't it just so... I don't know. I can't can't describe it. It's just so nice. It's, like, quaint. They have, you know... It's quaint, but yuppie. Okay, maybe. But I just love how you can stroll through the streets on the weekend. Because it's not small town. Not anymore. I feel like it just keeps growing and growing. Yeah. But you know what I mean? It doesn't... Mm -hmm. It's kind of... It has that small town vibe. They've created it, but it's not a small town. I guess that's a good way to put it. It just seems very wholesome, and everyone down there is so nice. I can't describe it. I just always feel like everybody's happy. I don't know. I mm-hmm. really enjoy being there. It makes me happy. So, Kelly was really comfortable on stage. She was a great gymnast. She was actually trained by a very good Olympic coach, and I didn't put it in here. Bella something. Yeah, it was Bella something. Either way, that's here nor there. But she was trained from the time she was little to be a star. You can imagine she was really good at acrobatics, performing in front of people. She could really move and dance on the stage. I was actually watching one of her competition videos, and she was really good. Um, Like, she was she was a superstar. She was going places. I mean, I, I can't even imagine if you were just a bodybuilder or in this fitness competition and you had... You didn't have that background. You didn't have that charisma. It would be really tough to follow her. She she had a great, you know, she had a big advantage. She ended up entering her first co- uh, fitness competition after college, and she won. And she just kind of kept on winning. She was really, she was really something to see on stage. Crowds went wild over her routines. They loved watching her up there. That's unique because not many body, bodybuilders no, are flexible. You don't normally see that. No, no offense, but I don't. It's just I'd rather watch paint dry than watch a bodybuilding competition i just feel like you see the same thing and they walk on the stage and they all yeah, we can't thing. appreciate what they're no we what they're trying I, we to really demonstrate can't. and i i hate seeing it that way because i have a lot of respect for the people who can be that regimented and do that in their craft but yet it's not my thing mm-hmm. i don't want to sit there and watch it's like it. golf yeah golf. golf i love to golf but if you're gonna put it on tv i'm falling asleep it's different but watching her up there on that stage i i would not have been able to say this is a fitness competition. You know what I mean? It didn't look like that at all. It was very entertaining. They nicknamed her Flyin' Ryan, and she really set the bar high at these shows. She had even held the title Miss Fitness America at one time. She had also won Miss Fitness Olympia, Fitness International, and several other competitions. She was also very aware of Craig and his reputation. And when he first pursued her, she was not interested at all. But... You know how these things go, and eventually he wore her down. Mm-hmm. He just wouldn't take no for an answer. And they ended up getting married in June of 2000, and they got married in Vegas at the Little White Chapel. You can yeah. see that in your mind, I'm sure. I've been there. Uh, in the special that I watched, they actually talked how Kelly seemed to change after that. Not only her personality and kind of just from the people that really knew her, but she started getting all these plastic surgeries. And it was said that Craig was the one who was encouraging all of this. And again, I don't, I'm not saying it's for her body. I think yeah, it was, more it was more of her face, but cause I don't even know if that's allowed. Like if you get any kind of enhancement, you're probably 
d- disqualified, right? When yeah, I'd imagine I'm making that up, but I'm... I would imagine there's some sort of rules. Yeah, yeah. you would think. No sort of augmentation. No. Yeah, you can't just, you know. Kelly was now involved, though, in this lifestyle that Craig had had going on before. And I'm sure she wasn't... It wasn't like, oh, all of a sudden we're married and here I'm in this this lifestyle. I mean, I'm sure it was a slow progression into it. And she knew what she was getting into, of course. Wild parties, sex, drugs. I'm sure it was even more crazy because of the fact that they lived in Vegas and who they were. And, you know, I'm sure they were invited to all of these crazy parties. And mm-hmm. this just seemed normal, right? Because this is what everybody was doing around them. So now enter Melissa James. She was the personal assistant that Craig and Kelly end up having come to live with them in their home. That, to me, is very... Bad idea. Very bad idea. Very strange. I couldn't I couldn't see being in, in a position like that. Even if you're a nanny or whatever. I, you need your own place. You don't go live with a married couple. I mean, right? No. I mean, I know, like, all pairs and stuff. I mean, and some nannies, but... I guess it just depends on everybody's histories and well that and I mean I guess you know, there's I like mean, a guest house or something separate on the property but but if you're 30 years old you're not going to go or you know if you're 30 years old you're not going to go and hire this hot 25 year old nanny you're going to hire or you do and then you're real surprised when all of a sudden do you know what I mean like you just yeah. got to use good judgment in yeah. this situation absolutely she sounds like she's around the same age right yeah. as they are she's a little bit younger um right but i mean still in the same yeah yeah she's still yeah, correct yeah no there's it's it's just a bad situation overall her close friend samantha said that melissa had agreed to fly out to vegas basically to help them launch their new their new clothing store Melissa was a dancer. She was an instructor. She was trained in ballet, hip hop, and jazz. She opened her own studio, actually, down in Florida. At She was only 19. I mean, it's Samantha, her friend, had said it was her dream since she was little to grow up and teach other people how to dance. She had also mentioned just how she was just such a wonderful person. She said she's the type of person that could walk into a room full of complete strangers and leave with more friends than you could count. She was just one of those people that people enjoyed talking to, and she was very charismatic and she sounded like a she sounded like a pretty like a pretty good friend, someone that was at least fun to be around. She had met Craig when she was in her mid twenties at a fitness competition in two thousand one in Panama, where they supposedly started this long friendship. Right, well, you can read between the lines yeah, I'm there. Sure like, there were rumors more. that it was more, but come on, it it was more than that. There's no way. So this is not the person that you hire to come live with you. No, if there's a pre existing relationship. She was completely starstruck with Craig. She was impressed by everything that he was doing and everything that he accomplished. And she, she just, I think she just kind of felt that she could get a step up if she attached herself to this. Yeah. To this Going out to Vegas, maybe getting into their network. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could see that Mm -hmm. for sure. And she's young. She's in her, you know, she's in her mid twenties. Maybe she wanted to go and experience all of that. You know, she had. She had, I don't know. You know what I mean. I do. But Sam said Melissa started to change after she moved in. And she suspected that they introduced her into that world of drugs. Because they were known to not only have steroids, but cocaine and yeah. others. He's already arrested night. for X. I'm not surprised. Yeah, yeah. you're not Party surprised. drugs. Party drugs. And Craig was definitely calling the shots. So maybe Kelly was okay with the whole thing. Who knows at the beginning. Uh, Samantha had even suspected that Kelly was just very insecure. She, for being like this highly respected athlete who looked like she controlled the stage and, and was very confident, it seemed like she just wasn't that way personally about her looks and her marriage and everything else. She just kind of, she kind of just did whatever Craig wanted her to do. It seemed like, you know, oh, Mm -hmm. well, whatever makes you happy, you know, and she just kind of dealt with it. So you'll soon learn that we're never really going to get the whole truth here. Like I mentioned, it's all half truths, but it's up for debate and. We can discuss it. And Samantha agreed with what I had told you earlier that Melissa had hopes to that, you know, by connecting herself that she could maybe even launch her career or the dance studio that I had mentioned. It fell on hard times in 2005. Apparently there was some kind of a bad business deal and it just didn't it just went south. 
And so that could also be another reason that she thought, okay, well, maybe I'll make enough money to get my studio back or at least... You can start something in Vegas. Start something in Vegas or do something, go in a different direction. I'm sure that was, I'm sure that was the hope. So she came back. She's hoping to, you know, to help out with this clothing company that they're trying to get started. But her mom said that after only living with them for a few months, she, she wanted to get out. She said that she wasn't getting paid, uh, that the, that the marriage was kind of on the rocks. They were fighting a lot. I can't even imagine. So you move out to Vegas, you're living in this awkward situation, you're not getting paid, this clothing store is not happening, you know, get out. Leave. Get get home. And maybe that's what she was trying to do. And I mentioned that even though she wasn't getting paid, it sounded like Craig was giving her a credit card to use for, like, here, use this for whatever you need, but don't tell Kelly. Mm -hmm. Like, that's another big red flag. So that's probably maybe why there's a mention of that she was stealing from them and using mm-hmm. Kelly's credit card. It could have even been a case of Kelly was, oh, my God, she's stealing from us. And, she, and Craig just says, oh, that's oh, horrible. I have no he's idea. Really but he's really her. giving her the credit card and the money. I mean, that's yeah. probably what I, we like I said, there's going to be a lot of speculation on some of these things. We can only guess. But. Maura James, Melissa's mom that I had mentioned before, said that she was super close with her daughter. They would go shopping and make crafts and bake together. So I'm sure she was really excited when Melissa called her on the 13th and said, I'm coming home. I'm going to be there for the holiday season. I get to spend Christmas with you. And sadly, that was the last phone call that she had had with her daughter. Um, Detective Dino Kelly believes that it was possible that just hours before her flight, because she had a ticket that wasn't made up. She really did have that ticket home that Craig apparently had paid for her. But he thinks that she maybe threatened to expose them for who they were. You know, all the drugs. Something happened that before. Made. Yeah, he's thinking that something possibly happened where she was like, and I'm going to tell everybody that you're not really who you mm-hmm. claim to be or portray, you know, portray. She was, yeah, doing a mic drop. Yes. Let's circle back now to... Craig and Kelly talk to the police. They leave. This is when they decide, we're out of here. We're not sticking around. They actually had planned to flee the country. They took uh, they took some money. They packed some of their things. And they headed to the Boston area where they supposedly had a friend that they could liquidate some of their assets and try to get some passports. And I'm guessing at this point, most likely, they're trying to get fake passports. And I don't know how easy that is or how easy that was. Like, I don't... I feel like that can't be that easy to do these days, but... Like, I, who has a connection? Like, hey, let's get fake passports. Like, if you and I had to leave right now, I wouldn't even know what to do. <laughs> like, right? fake or expedited? I don't know. Well, I mean, at this point, the you... FBI is involved. And so they're going to be making sure that they're not leaving the country. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, that there's yeah. going to be alerts at the airport. They're going to be flagged, I would think. Right, right. So, I don't know. I just, yeah, I just no. thought that was interesting because it did, I couldn't find any more on that. But I'm thinking, like, wow, you know, people with all these connections? That's crazy. Mm-hmm. But, hey, you know, I don't I know. I guess if you're into drugs and yeah. doing all the things that you do, you know the people that can take care of that? Maybe. The couple that was with Kelly and Ryan on the 13th were also questioned by the police. I mean, of course. Megan and Jeremy. I'm not going to give last names here. I'm just going to give first names on friends. They claimed they were with them the night before they left. Craig had just handed them a duffel bag and asked them to hold on to it for a few weeks. Like, who just says, like, sure, I'll take this random black duffel bag and hold on to it for you? No problem. inside first. Yeah, so I'm sure they looked in the bag at some point or right away. They found a taser gun inside along with a few other things. So when they start seeing these news reports and all hell's breaking loose and they see, you know, oh, they can't find them. There's a body in the trunk. This car's in the... They bring the bag into the police station and they sit down and they obviously answer a few more questions. Not long after that, another couple that they were really close with, Amanda and Ryan, call the police and they claim that the couple had come to their home. They had panicked. The police had just been there and had initially questioned them about the car. They tell their friends that they're, they found their assistant dead of a drug overdose and they didn't know what to do, that they panicked. And they were worried about their careers. They're like, oh, as soon as somebody sees, you know, that someone died at our home, it's going to be all over the news and then we're done. You know, that's it. So that's what they claim. They claim that that was the reason that they 
So they're saying they did dispose of her body, basically, and start the fire. Yes. But they didn't kill her. This is what they're trying to say. Yes. Kelly tells Amanda that they didn't know what to do. They went to the local Walmart. They got lighter fluid. They put the body in the trunk. They burned the car in the desert to get rid of it. I mean, what would she think? Amanda, I mean, she's she's not stupid. It sounds like she's just as confused as you look. Well, no matter what, that's not cool. No. Like, it doesn't well, matter how she found but her. But if you haven't, okay, regardless, like, you're. No matter what, you can't burn the body. That's not right. You call 911. It just doesn't. It, no. Well, it doesn't make sense. Just no. Why, why would you dispose of and burn a body unless there was something that you didn't want them to find? There's something on that body they don't want that they don't want to be found. She didn't just OD. Yeah. And Amanda thinks the same thing. She's very confused. She's like, why wouldn't you just call the police? That doesn't make sense. Your story doesn't make sense. So they share all of this with the police, of course. And they also see that Craig has made several phone calls to a man named Anthony Gross. I didn't put a whole lot about this kid in here because from what I read, he was just very enamored with Craig and he was... He was, he was, it just sounded like he was manipulated. It was one of those guys that Craig knew he looked up to him so much that if he asked him to do anything, he would do it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, hey, come, it's three, it's about three o'clock in the morning. Need you to come out with some gas and help us burn a car in the desert. No problem, Craig. What else do you need? Can I pick up some tacos on the way? Yeah. Like this is that, this is that guy, right? I'm not saying that he's innocent and he should have, there's a lot of things that he should have done, but I just don't feel like he's as important in the story. He, it just sounds like he would have done anything that was asked of him. On surveillance, you can clearly see Anthony going into the convenience store around 3.40 in the morning the night of the 13th. So he was getting supplies, obviously. On video at Walmart, you can see Kelly shopping around the same time. She purchased a barbecue set and seven bottles of lighter fluid. So as she's leaving Walmart with their purchase, Craig pulls up with the Jaguar and he helps her unload all of the items into the back seat. Because there's a body in the trunk. Correct. I mean, this is where, you know, obviously nobody can see it. They don't open it up. But there's just no reason you would put a barbecue set and all of those things in the back seat of your car all awkward. Or a Jaguar. Yeah. Unless the trunk space was occupied. Compromised. In other surveillance, you can see Anthony's truck heading down the highway and then the Jaguar's following it. Clearly, they just needed somebody to help them... Bring more gas. I mean, I guess they didn't have enough with the lighter fluid. So I guess he had brought like a gas container, the kind that you just fill up, you know, Mm -hmm. for lawnmowers or whatever. And after the fire was set, he drove them back to their house. Police have enough at this point to get a warrant with all the evidence and the statement they've collected. And I believe I mentioned at this point, they do bring in the FBI. So once they locate them near Logan International Airport, they send in a SWAT team. They're not going to take any chances. Craig's this big guy. He could be on drugs. He could be armed. I mean, they just don't know. I mean, I, I, you know, they're prepared to use as much force as necessary. But when they find him in his truck in the parking lot, he goes quietly. He's just, it's, it's very quick. It's easy. They find Kelly nearby. He knows why they're there. He knows. I mean, they're, they're found. He's waiting in the parking lot for Kelly, who's actually in getting her nails done at the salon. Because, you know. Gotta get your nails done. <laughs> gotta keep up appearances. So you've heard the first story, and now that they're in custody, here comes version number two. They have their friends over the night of the 13th, and as they're leaving, he and Kelly open the garage door, and everyone sees Melissa in the car, dead of an overdose. Everyone. Oh, no. What do we do? Right? Now all these accomplices are all, all these All of these people apparently know. But they don't know that they know. You know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? I know. <laughs> <laughs> so it this... They say they panic. They drag her body into the living room. They lay her on a blanket. Craig says that because he loves her and couldn't look at her face, he wraps her head in duct tape. No. 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 What? Go get me the duct tape. I don't know. When we need things like that, there's always like scuffle in the garage trying to find the duct tape. It's not like you just or... keep that stuff on the kitchen counter. No. No. And that takes effort. You know how it, it is to use duct tape to wrap something in duct tape? That's work well it is it's just it's very specific and it's very you're covering up her face because you can't look at her because you did something really bad yeah that's why they put her body in the trunk then and they come up with a plan to burn her you know to burn her in the car in the desert this is what they say so that's version number two 
Police re-interview the friends. And they say, yeah, nobody was in that car. We didn't, never saw a buddy. We don't know what they're talking about. Megan now says, Craig told the couple they had a fight with Melissa over money and things went sideways. So according to Craig, Kelly and Melissa were fighting over a taser gun. And at some point, Kelly wins and starts tasing Melissa. At this point, he walks in, grabs Melissa, and drags her down the stairs and starts beating her. This is when Kelly comes in and injects her leg with a full syringe of morphine. So that's another, that's the the version that the friends tell that they gave them that night. This is what they did. I don't know why they didn't come to the police sooner. But, yeah, because, you know. That's, I guess, neither here nor there, but I, I'd be like, okay, yeah, shut the door, lock it. Hello, police? police? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh, so after story time and the couple are leaving, he then gives them the bag, right? Like, hey, here you go. Hang on to this for a few weeks. Appreciate it. See you later. I don't know why you take the bag, but maybe you just want to get the hell out of the house at this point, right? Mm. I don't know. And the police think, you know, of course, that he wanted to get the evidence out of his house, but he also maybe was hoping that, that, that they would be tied at this point. Like, now you're an accomplice to yeah, our story. You, you know, you're, you're hiding much. things from me. And maybe he felt like they would just go along with whatever they said. But they didn't. I also found sources that said that Craig was trying to be buddy-buddy with the officers. So here, so just imagine this, right? Here's this guy calling him bro and telling him all the time, like, hey, man, what a great job you're doing in this investigation. That's so smart. You're just, wow. You know what I mean? Like, this, you can, you can yeah, see it, Yeah, I can right? see it. I mean, I, he's such a narcissist. He's, he's such a, I'm going to get away with this, so I might as well. Like, he didn't even seem phased. He didn't think he was going to get in trouble for this. <laughs> That's the kind of guy we're dealing with. I even read that there at one point he was like, oh, did you, dude, did you find the steroids in the house? And they were like, Yes, we found the steroids. It's like, oh man, that's that's some investigating skills there, bro. Like, man, wow, you got you know what I mean? So you guys get it. I've painted the picture. Well, let's jump back to the body, okay? It takes three weeks to finally ID Melissa's body. Sadly, as I mentioned, her mother, she knew from that first phone mm-hmm. call. She knew. Unfortunately, the body was so badly burned that even with the evidence found during the autopsy, the medical examiner has to conclude that the cause of death is undetermined. They just they just can't rule out any other possible conditions for her cause of death. I get it, but it's frustrating, right? It's like, oh, can you at least just say she was murdered? Can you at least just say it's a homicide? No, they can't. They can't do that. I get it, right? Yeah, I mean, if they don't, they can't see it. They can't say it. It just really, it's it's hard because prosecutors are looking at this going, okay. This girl, no matter what the actual cause of death, did not somehow wrap her face up in duct tape, shoot herself in the leg with morphine, tase herself six times with 50,000 volts of electricity, and then drive the jag to the desert, climb in the back, strangle herself, and set herself on fire. She did not do those things. Correct. That is not what happened here. There's some sort of foul play. Yeah, so they're thinking, God, there's no way these two are going to get away with this. We have to figure out what happened and, how, and at least nail them for something because they're guilty. I just, I can't even, right? As an investigator, like, okay, I'm trying to do, do, you know, I'm trying to do everything by the book here and I'm trying to do this, but you got to throw me a bone. Mm-hmm. Come on, honey, <laughs> you know? But I get it. By the way, I didn't mention, I didn't mention the teaser. This is actually really cool. Because of the clip, like the cartridge inside, and I didn't know this, the manufacturing company actually gets records of when the gun goes off. Did you know that? How? I mean, I think it's just electronic. Like, it sends maybe, like, a signal, like a cell phone. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I I didn't look into all the the its and bits on that, but I I thought that was really cool. Um, So they were able to give the police a report and say, on December 13th, at this location between 2.10 and 2.12 a.m., the taser went off six times. Each time, 50,000 volts of electricity. That's a lot. Mm-hmm. Police even went back to their home. They Why do you even have a taser? Yeah. You know. Anyways, go on. <laughs> no, I hear you. That's okay. You just shout out anything that you're thinking. <laughs> Police even, they go back to the home and they're able to find these taser dots, which I thought this was cool too. So when the gun does go off, it leaves behind these little dots that look like confetti. Well, they kind of look like those little hole punch mm-hmm. like dots, if you can imagine that. 
um, they found some on the floor and they'd even tried to clean up, clean up the crime scene because they found some in the vacuum cleaner, like in the, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. The um, the little, I couldn't think of it, like the, the canister in the vacuum cleaner that you have to, um, dump out. And now we hear the third version of the story. It suggested that a fight broke out between the girls, the tasers being used on Kelly, Craig comes to her rescue. And then, of course, everything else is pretty much the same. Gotcha. You know, he drags her in, beats her, all of those things that followed. I also found yet another possible version that's not discussed everywhere in, in all of my sources, but it, I did find it and I thought it was an, at least interesting enough to mention. During an interview, an agent suggests that maybe they were having rough sex at the time of her death, to which Craig was like, and I quote, yeah, we were having sex and she OD'd. Let's go with that. That's a good story. End quote. So it sounds again like he's like, like, yeah, yeah, bro. That's a good one. Like, is that better? Is that the one we should go with? Sure. Yeah, I like that. That works. Mm. So then it's at this point, it's like, it's he's dating. agreeing with what they're coming up with. He's like, he's lying. He's saying, I mean, there's, it's all over the place. Yeah. Right. They're like, well, so which one do we go with? Right. Wink, wink. Which one is the best story for when we go to, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Gross. When asked about the wires around her neck, which of course was not mentioned at all by Craig or Kelly in any of the previous interviews, Craig says, and I quote, you know, honestly, this is the honest to God's truth. Okay, which pause for a minute, because remember back when we were in that class, I can't remember the guy's name. He was so good. And he was showing us all those examples of when people are lying and how they say like that. Yeah, the verbal cues. Yeah. yeah. So as soon as he said, Honestly, this is the honest to God's truth. I'm like, you're lying. Not that we didn't know he was lying before, but it's interesting that you do see some of those cues, even in public speakers and other things on TV and interviews. And you're like, oh. When, you get, when they give a statement, you yeah. know. And you kind of pick it out and go, that's not right. You wouldn't mm-hmm. say that. So he says, and I quote, you know, honestly, this is the honest to God's truth. When I was tying her up in the cocoon-like position, I used duct tape and I used the robe ties. But there was something else I used that broke. I can't remember what it was. A phone cord, maybe? End quote. So if you're doing something like this, even in a panic, and I don't even care, you don't forget what you're doing. You don't forget the order that things happen. You don't forget what you used. Right? I don't know. I just think it's interesting that he was talking about tying her up in a cocoon. Yeah. I was distracted by that. Cocoon like position. Like they they put her knees to her chest and they were like wrapped her up like that. Probably to fit her in the trunk. I'm sure the trunk of the car was really small. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can kind of so picture it now. Like they like right tuck now. her head in, they yeah. pull her knees up to her chest and they and they kinda of, and maybe that's where the rope ties and the other stuff came into play where maybe they used that to like keep her in that position and, and in the car fire and everything and maybe it ended and up here the around neck. the neck. I mean, who knows, right? Yeah. Now we're just making, now we're just speculating. Like I said, we would. Kelly, however, during all of her interviews, she sticks to the story. She found Melissa dead in the car. That's it. That's all she's saying. Even though they couldn't get the medical examiner to say homicide, they were able to verify that she was injected with morphine and they had the taser evidence that I mentioned that proved that it was fired at her home and the exact times. In February 2006, the two are extradited from Boston to Nevada, and they're denied bail. Of course, they're trying to flee the country. Um, Did I mention that he's from Greece, and they thought that maybe they were going to head to Greece? So I think that was the plan. They were trying to get there because they have no extradition. In March of 2006, they're indicted by a grand jury. Both plead not guilty to the charges of murder, kidnapping, and arson. Kelly's defense team maintained that she didn't have anything to do with Melissa's death. Trial is set to begin in May of 2008, nearly two years later, but at the last minute, they accept plea deals. So obviously somebody was saying, we don't like our chances with a jury. This doesn't look good. You're... It's nauseating that it takes two years to get to that point. It is. It is. But I think because the death penalty is on the table, you want to roll the dice? What a waste of resources for two years. I mean, I'm sure they get credit for time served and blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff, but... Mm -hmm. How unfair to the family and everything to wait for two years before they go to trial. I know, and I would be... That's a long time. It is a really long time. And that's usually the case in most of our stories. What's going on in those two years? (laughs) Well, look at the story that I did on the the 
Hollywood murders. The wait, what am I? Why am I completely blanking? The guy that was from Glenview. That their family here from Illinois. They're still waiting. Gargiulio, Michael Gargiulio, and his whole thing. They're still waiting. Yeah, but that was for different because back. he was being tried in different states. This one, he he's was, already there in Nevada, and he, he was. But I remember that that trial also took a really long time. Yeah, the he was all over. Like yeah. this one, I feel like if you're you're charged and you're already in the state, you're sitting on two years. I don't mm-hmm. know. I could be. I'm not in that business, so I probably shouldn't talk. But it seems yeah. like a long time. Yeah, but I mean, just I just remember in his case out where he was being charged the first time in California. And then obviously they're still waiting, but it took a really long time for that California trial. It's just crazy how everything's just like, and we're, you know, and we're pushing it and we're pushing it. I don't know. It just, yeah. it needs to happen faster. I agree. Kelly pleads guilty to arson and assault with a deadly weapon. So basically she's taken responsibility for the fight that she had with Melissa. Finally, the defense team feels that the deal was fair. She received six to 26 years. She was actually released in, two, in 2017. She spent nine years in prison. And she also filed for divorce while she was incarcerated as well. So, Craig pled guilty to second-degree murder, arson, and kidnapping. And he says, and I quote, I took the plea bargain and admitted to something that did not happen so my wife could go home. End quote. Okay, so he's still not taking any responsibility for mm-hmm. anything. He's making it sound like he's still... Being the good guy here. Oh, well, I didn't. He's like a murder. Yes. It just, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I don't know that he ever will ever take responsibility or say, I'm sorry. No, it's not going to happen. He received 51 years. He's eligible for parole after 21 in 2006, in 2026. So he'll be, he'll be almost 60 and he's eligible for, for parole. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's hope that he doesn't get out. How do you feel about the sentencing and how everything? I don't know if Kelly should have gotten less, personally. I feel Um, like she was probably equal. Mm -hmm. Equally Um, complicit, for sure. Yeah. I feel like in any situation where you have messed with a crime scene... Well, she went along with it. She was lying. She was covering it up. She was willing yeah. to flee with him. At that point, mm-hmm. you had your opportunity to like come clean in your part, and you didn't. So I, I feel like they should have had equal sentences, personally. Yeah, I agree. I but. agree. And I didn't put it in there, but Anthony Gross did do... Um, he was put on probation as well. Yeah, he... He oh. shouldn't have followed anybody into the desert with a gas can. No. Yeah. It's a bad idea. No. It's, I don't know. And here's me assuming again. I don't think he knew. He just... But you know at 3.40 in the morning when you're driving people out to the desert to, like, get rid of a car. And it's not a good day. It's not, it's not on the yeah. up and up. Yeah. You yeah. know? There's, some, not, there's something there's, going on there. Yeah. I yeah. agree. Well, I liked your story. I mean, it's a sad story, but it, I didn't know it. And yeah. um, a little peek into the bodybuilding world. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I was doing my research, I can't believe how many athletes have gotten into trouble. Oh, a lot. they are trouble. Sorry, yeah. athletes. <laughs> I guess, I guess Success <laughs> and money and power. And, oh, mm-hmm. It's really hard to balance. We know that with anyone that's famous. Yeah, that's true. And that amount of success. But all right. Well. We probably need to wrap it up because we got a piece out here. We do. It's time. They're kicking us out. So we have to leave. One more cup of coffee and hit the road. Hopefully you guys uh, are also going to have a great week. And if you think of it, please hop on to wherever you listen. And if they allow you to rate and review, please rate and review us. We really appreciate it. Um, You know, it just kind of gives us an idea of, how how we're doing and we love hearing from you if you have any stories or anything that you'd like to share please send them in if you have any requests hey we would love to do some stories upon request so let us know what you're what you want to hear yeah. maybe there's something that you want to know more about that's not really been covered we'll do the research for you and we'll throw it out there so let us know sounds like a plan 
All right. Until next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.